Here are some of the stories you'll see next on 28 Eyewitness News Saturday morning. Work on I-81 resumes today and so do traffic headaches. An accident victim whose religious beliefs are at the center of controversy. Plus, they say it's no surprise that a murder happened here. And our lead story, two people in the hospital after their truck is rammed by a tractor trailer. Eyewitness News starts right now. Live from WBRE-TV, the station that's taking the lead. This is 28 Eyewitness News, Saturday morning. Good morning, everyone. It's just before 9 a.m. Saturday morning, May 4th, 1996. I'm Andy Mahalshik. And I'm Lauren Perkins. We have a lot to tell you about this morning. We'll have the story of an area man who is now on the national spotlight. Plus, we'll tell you why people living in one area neighborhood hit by flooding now say they are being left high and dry by the government. But first, let's check out the weekend forecast with John Klevinowski. And I hear something about wetness coming our way, yes. John. That's right, a whole bunch of wetness moving on in by early this afternoon. Showers and some thunderstorms. We still have some morning fog around. Today's high temperature should make it up to about 70 degrees. All right, thank you, John. Our lead story this morning, a nasty crash on I-8380 in Lackawanna County. It happened just after 5 this morning on the, the I-380 West off-ramp near Exit 1 at Teague Street. A Chevy Blazer with four passengers inside was hit from behind by a tractor trailer. Those inside the Blazer were taken to Scranton area hospitals. The driver of the rig was not seriously injured. Four teenagers from our area spent last night in the hospital. Their pickup truck ran off the road and ended up in the Lackawanna River. The accident happened just before 11 o'clock last night on Brighton Avenue in Scranton. Police say there were five teenagers in the pickup when it hit the water. They were able to get out of the truck on their own. One of the kids ran from the scene, but the other four were taken to the hospital for possible hypothermia. No one was seriously injured. Investigators tell us that alcohol was not a factor in the crash and that charges will not be filed in this accident. It was like something out of a movie, but this was all too real. A man is shot dead at work by a disgruntled fellow employee. The shooting happened at TRL Trucking in Pittston Township, Luzerne County. Eyewitness News reporter Carol McKenzie talks to a man who used to work at the company. He says he's not surprised it happened. Here's her exclusive interview. This is bound to happen. A TRL dispatcher is dead and a truck driver is under arrest for killing him. Not saying that I wished it had happened, it's bound to happen because there's no communication between some of these dispatchers and these drivers. Kevin Jones drove for TRL for six months in 1995 until he and the company agreed he should leave. Jones says he was unhappy because the company was a very tense place to work. Police say trucker Dick Clark shot Ed Lillis to death after arguing on the two-way over a hotel bill. When Clark got back to headquarters, witnesses say he walked inside, pulled a gun, told Lillis he was sick of his BS and shot him four times. Police arrested Clark back in his truck, and that's where they found the gun several hours later. I think it could have been avoided. I feel sorry for that the uh, the dispatcher got shot, and I feel condolence towards his family. Give your BS. Now, Clark is from Latrobe. He is in the Luzerne County Jail tonight on a criminal homicide charge. A judge in Columbia County is upholding an accident victim's religious beliefs. But the court order could keep doctors from saving the young man's life. 17-year-old Tony Briggs suffered a severe head injury in a car crash in, in Makanaqua Thursday night. Doctors at Geisinger Medical Center say Tony needs a blood transfusion. But because Tony is a Jehovah's Witness, transfusions are against his religion. While Tony had signed a form stating he doesn't want the procedure under any circumstances, that form is not binding because legally, Tony is not an adult. After hearing from testimony from the boy's family and friends, Judge Gailey Keller upheld Tony's request. Doctors say he might live without the transfusion, but damage to Tony's brain could be severe. He is listed in critical condition this morning. The battle between medical treatment and religious beliefs was the topic of our 28 telepoll last night. We asked, should doctors respect the religious beliefs of a patient in a life or death situation? 77% of you said yes, they should respect patients' religious rights. 23% said no, they should not. Thank you for your calls. A Luzerne County boy who died after going to the dentist's office will be laid to rest today. Funeral services will be held this morning for three-year-old Jonathan Walski of Sweet Valley. 
Walski died after being put under gas anesthesia at the offices of doctors Watkins and Madura in Dallas on Wednesday morning. The county coroner says he died from an adverse reaction to anesthesia, but the circumstances surrounding the boy's death are still under question. State dental officials are also investigating, as is the DA's office. Now, a memorial fund has been set up. You can send contributions to the Sweet Valley Church of Christ, RR2 Box 2430, Sweet Valley, PA 18656. One of the men accused in the beating death of former Governor Robert Casey's organ donor has pleaded guilty. Ian Littlejohn pleaded guilty in Westmoreland County Court during his trial for killing Michael Lucas. Littlejohn was arrested for allegedly ordering the murder of Lucas in connection with a drug ring. Now, Lucas's heart and liver were transplanted into the ailing Casey. Doctors say the transplant definitely saved Casey's life. As for Littlejohn, he faces up to 70 years in prison. The mystery man we first told you about Thursday night is no longer a complete mystery. A family member recognized him after watching our story on Nightbeat. We still don't know why Richard Cordier took a bus from Wilkes-Barre to Binghamton, New York. Police picked him up at the bus station there because he was acting confused and was totally unresponsive. Police have been trying to find out who he was for three weeks. Now the man's sister saw our story on Nightbeat and called the police. We don't know when his sister will be able to bring the man home, but he will be home soon. Well, the evidence went up in flames as long stored and no longer needed evidence from the Scranton Police Department was destroyed under court supervision on Friday. The destruction was approved by county court as part of the city's effort to clear space and records following the disappearance of some evidence last year. A state police probe resulted in the arrest of Officer William Sikoski. The old evidence went up in smoke at the Red Cross incinerator in Hanover Township, Luzerne County. The neighborhood impact team in Wilkes-Barre was on patrol overnight, and Wilkes-Barre police are targeting certain areas in the city for a major crime sweep. They're looking out for vandalism, criminal mischief, traffic violations, and underage drinking. The program is part of Mayor Tom McGordy's campaign to make our neighborhoods safer. People who live in Scranton's plot section are not a happy group this weekend, to say the least. Dozens of homes in the plot and along Nayog Avenue were damaged by floodwaters back in January. Now the Army Corps of Engineers says it won't spend the money to protect them from future flooding by the Lackawanna County River. The Corps says that's while neighbors on the other side of the river get help. On the one side of the river, they can get a dollar back in uh, saving of property. But on the plot side, Nayog side of the river, for every dollar they spend, they can only get 60 cents back. And if it's not a dollar for dollar, they won't do the project. But Mayor Connors is not giving up. He says there are still two more funding opportunities being explored to provide the $20 million it would take to bring flood protection to the plot. An area teenager is getting some national exposure. His thoughts on teen gangs are now published for all to read in a national news magazine for kids. Pete Yaksik has the story. 11-year-old Ryan Sundra appears to be a typical 6th grader at Hazleton's A.D. Thomas Elementary. But his name and ideas now grace the pages of this week's edition of REACT, a news magazine for kids. National sports figures and teen heartthrobs command plenty of column space. However, the magazine pushes its readers to raise their voices on some serious issues, such as anorexia, race relations, and gang violence which Ryan wrote about after reading a REACT article where a gang member becomes paralyzed during a gang shootout. What have you seen happening here in the Hazleton area that related to the story? Well, I've seen a lot of violence like up at our junior high and they're even getting more strict like they're called the cops on fights anymore. It's gotten so bad. Police have been called to the Hazleton area high school in recent months to calm gang tensions. Ryan emailed REACT with his views and suggestions. He writes, gang violence and the number of gang members are rising because kids these days feel out of place, insecure, and unprotected. Joining gangs makes them feel important. Ryan believes the government should form support groups for young kids in cities and that sentences for gang-related crimes should be much harsher. And how does Ryan take his words now actually being published? I didn't expect that at all, and I know like my whole class reads it. Do you think you're going to be a little more popular when you get back to school? Um, a tiny bit. 
Now, Ryan's parents give the magazine high marks. They say it encourages kids to read and, in turn, to develop strong and sound opinions. As for Ryan, he's simply just busy being a kid and now soaking up some national spotlight here in Hazleton. Pete Gaxick, 28 Eyewitness News. The REACT magazines are circulated to students in English classes, classes throughout the country. Well, music, magic, and a very important message were the reasons for a big pep rally in Wilkes-Barre last night. The Northeast Council of Boy Scouts hosted its second Drugs, a deadly game pep rally at King's College Gymnasium. The program tries to show youngsters that drugs and alcohol are a deadly mix. The first rally was broadcast live on Friday morning on WBRE TV. It will be rebroadcast today at 1.30 here on Channel 28. Well, stay with us when we come right back. What will the merger of two health care insurance companies mean to area employees? Plus, some good news for a special child. The story and an update on little Joey coming up. And get the rain gear out of the closet. You're going to need it for early this afternoon. Power of Earth Watch in just a couple of minutes. You're watching 28 Eyewitness News on WBRE. Now, the best newscast in Pennsylvania continues on WBRE-TV. Work resumes this morning on construction work on I-81 near the industrial project in Scranton. This after a day off. As a result, you can expect some big-time traffic delays. That's right. PennDOT is working on the Bunker Street Bridge project. Part of that project calls for huge concrete beams to be placed near the Drinker Street exit. That work will take another three weeks or so. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Northeastern Pennsylvania intends to merge with Capital Blue Cross of the Harrisburg area. Company President Thomas Ward confirmed the report you first heard on Eyewitness News Thursday night. More than 600 Blue Cross employees filled the ballroom of Genetti's in Wilkesbury for the 8 o'clock Friday morning meeting. The announcement follows months of rumors and speculation. A Blue Cross spokesperson says the proposed combination would serve 2 million people in 34 Pennsylvania counties with improved service and services. Blue Cross will keep local operations in Wilkes-Barre, although some jobs will be changed. No cuts are expected or have been announced at this point. We have some good news to pass along this morning on a story we first told you about in March. Little Joey Rafolo suffers from a rare disease called diamond black fan anemia. He needs a bone marrow transplant to survive. Now, Joey's family tells Health Beat reporter Diana Penna that Joey will be going to the Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York for the transplant. Joey was first denied the transplant at Cincinnati's Children's Hospital because his family's health coverage. But now, there is great hope for this little boy who has had so much to deal with. And the Teddy Bear Patrol has proven to be a useful tool for many area police departments. Our very own Mark Killer reports how one area department is ready to reap the rewards of that program. Officer Sam Blasky has served the Plymouth Police Department for three and a half years. Much of his work the past year has been in the juvenile division, investigating cases involving children. A lot of times you have uh, the child being very emotional. Uh, the parents of the child will be very emotional. They're trying to calm the, the child down, uh, as well as we're trying to get the child calmed down. Last month, Officer Blasky was promoted to juvenile officer. His new appointment means he may need to calm more troubled children. And that's why the police department participates in the teddy bear patrol. Officer Blasky has yet to hand out one of these plush bears in his new role as juvenile officer, but already he is aware of their value in handling an upset child. They'll need something that they know and they could relate to like a stuffed animal, which is that a lot of times that's their best friend. And that's why Officer Sam Blasky knows he can count on help just an arm's length away. We can hit, give the, uh, the teddy bear to a, to a child that's emotionally upset and a lot of times that'll calm him down and make us feel that we're his friend as well as the teddy bear. On the Teddy Bear Patrol, Mark Hiller, 28 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Mark. If you would like to support this program with a donation, send it to the Teddy Bear Patrol, care of WBRE-TV, 62 South Franklin Street, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, 18773. Teddy bears are cute. Well, the teddy bears can't tell us what the weather forecast is going to be. Maybe our own teddy bear can. Mm, and the weather's John not going to be cute today. <laughs> we have clouds now, fog. Uh, Just an ugly Saturday morning. Clouds yesterday, clouds today. It's not nice. Uh-uh, ugly. Yeah, yeah, everything else. Here's the trivia question for this morning. When high and low pressure systems are close together, what happens? Calm weather, strong winds, 
or perhaps even an ice age? Answer later, forecast is next. Meteorologist John Klebanowski's forecast has the seal of approval of the American Meteorological Society. Now, with the power of Earthwatch, here's your local forecast. What a way to start a weekend with foggy conditions, cloudy skies, and now we have some rain in the forecast for this afternoon. Temperatures aren't too bad, 56 right now. No rain so far, but we do have some rain on the way for early this afternoon. Relative humidity, 93%. Still got some patchy fog in the valleys. Air pressure is dropping off, breeze southwest at 2. Gust overnight, a whopping 6 miles per hour. Wow. Hold on to your, to your hats when you go outside, huh? Here's a live scan of 28 Super Doppler radar showing some rain down to the south. We got some rain up to the north over New York. And in between, it's dry. Right here, it's dry. So we're just waiting for the little area of rain to begin to move across northeast Pennsylvania. All of this rain is on the move towards the east. Here's Earthwatch. Big scene of Doppler radar shows lots of rain here over Ohio, down across West Virginia and parts of Pennsylvania. Again, it's moving towards the east. Then we have another big area of rain right here over central Missouri. You can see the purple showing up. That's severe weather, big thunderstorms, gusty strong winds, and also large hail now falling. They even have some severe weather watches posted and warnings for early this afternoon as this mess <clears throat> excuse me, begins to move towards the east rather quickly, heading right towards St. Louis. You see it right here, the big whopper of a thunderstorm. Again, it's all pushing off quickly towards the east. So that's something to watch for this afternoon. 3D satellite picture back at home across the northeast. Thick white clouds down to the south and out towards the west, all shifting off towards the coastline. It's going to be cloudy all day today and even into tonight. Cloudy and foggy now. Temperatures are in the low to mid 50s for everybody. Here's what's going on. Cloudy weather continuing all across the northeast and out towards the west. Area of a low pressure forming just along this cold front, and this cold front is going to stick around for the next couple of days, and it looks like we're going to remain cloudy all day today, tonight, and then tomorrow. And then finally by tomorrow afternoon, most of this will begin to move on towards the southeast. So that's some good news. At least we could save the weekend a little bit. Tonight, got the cold front kind of sitting right over us, cloudy skies, some rain and wet conditions, and then by tomorrow we're looking at the front to move just to the southeast of us. High pressure begins to build on in, and that means starting off cloudy and then a little bit of sunshine by the afternoon. Temperature's not too bad either tomorrow, mid to upper 60s. Here's the forecast for today. Doesn't look too nice, though. Cloudy skies, showers, thunderstorms, high of 70. Then tonight, partly to mostly cloudy, chance of a shower, possibly two, 51 degrees. And then tomorrow, cloudy and then some sunshine by the afternoon, high 65. Here's the five-day plan for Monday, 60 degrees, mostly cloudy skies, back in the soup with the rain. On Tuesday, dries out, but a high temperature of only 60. And then on Wednesday, 64 degrees and a mix of sunshine and clouds. So we got rain today, we have a dry day tomorrow, and then back in the rain again on Monday. Back and forth, back and forth. But it's spring. But the temperatures are going to be up, you got to think about that. Yeah, sure. in the 60s. Yeah, well, like I said, yeah, 70s. Yeah. maybe we'll get lucky and it'll change. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. Ah, all right. All right, thanks very much, John. Friday night sports action coming your way next on Eyewitness News Saturday morning. Jim Miller will have a complete wrap-up. Plus, are you in the mood for a movie this weekend? There's a new romantic tearjerker on the shelves at the video store. news happening or captured on your home video camera call the eyewitness news hotline at 1-800-358-WBRE or if you're a wireless one cellular customer dial star 28 it's a free call now 28 eyewitness sports 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Miller, and this is your Saturday morning sports report. The Scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons and Richmond Braves wrapped up their four game series at the Lackawanna County Stadium last night. Exciting night for it was a rehab start for Philadelphia Phillies right hander Kurt Schilling. Right hander Kurt Schilling helped himself early in this game. He flags down the hard ground ball to start a double play to get out of the inning, trailing 1 0. With the game tied 1-1, Gene Shaw takes this pinch to dead center field and it lands off the base of the wall. Glenn Murray comes around to score and the Red Barons let it through to one. Red Barons now trailing 3-2, bottom of the ninth inning, get a base hit off the bat of Glenn Murray to tie it up at 3-3 and set the stage for Howard Battle to win it. The Red Barons' third baseman shoots a base hit to right field to chase home the winning run and the Red Barons came back to post the victory at 4-3. And after the exciting game, we asked Kurt Schilling about his night of work. I didn't feel any different than I had the last five starts. <clears throat> you know, it's, a, it's been a struggle. To, I actually don't feel good until I'm out there pitching. I don't warm up well. I don't feel good warming up. And, and uh, you know, it doesn't all click until I get out there and warm up. Red Barons on the road in Pawtucket, Rhode Island over the weekend. They return home on Tuesday to begin a series with the Rochester Red Wings at the Lackawanna County Stadium. Last night, Atlanta, Georgia, Benito Santiago hits a pair of home runs, including this ninth-inning grand slam. The Phillies knocked off the defending world champion 6-3. Football news, former New York Giants linebacker Lawrence Taylor arrested in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for allegedly buying $100 of crack cocaine, one of 15 people nailed in a drug sting. Former Steelers All-Pro defensive end Kevin Green signs a two-year contract with the Carolina Panthers and the Pittsburgh Penguins down the New York Rangers in hockey. That's it for a Saturday morning. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'm Jim Miller, 28 Eyewitness Sports. Thank you, Jim. Well, you feel like a good cry this weekend, Andy? Uh, not really, <laughs> unless the bills come in, yes. Get some tissues and follow Clint Eastwood and Merrill Street to Madison County, Iowa. Their romantic tearjerker is making its home video debut. Dennis Michael has a look at that and another film featuring a patchwork of megastars. First, um, we have to find a theme. Now, for this particular quilt, the theme is where love resides. So what you're saying is that by harmonizing all these different elements, you're creating kind of a continuity in the piece? No. What I'm saying is I don't want to end up with some damn ugly quilt. <laughs> some very fine actresses stitched together how to make an American quilt and end up teaching student Winona Ryder a lot more about life than she expects to learn in her folk art project. It's a good rental. You want me to stop? Tell me now. Clint Eastwood shows he can still get the fire going in the bridges of Madison County with Meryl Streep also proving the baby boomers can still teach Generation X a thing or two about romance. We're not going to rob the money train. Why not? Because we, we, we're, we're, we're cops and, you know. But there isn't a whole lot to learn in Money Train. This cops and or robbers thriller reteaming Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson is strictly by the numbers. See you at the rental counter. Dennis Michael, CNN Entertainment News, Hollywood. When we come right back, we'll have a look at your weekend forecast. And we now know what sparked a fire that destroyed this business. Five people also homeless. Coming up on Eyewitness News Saturday morning. Now, the best newscast in Pennsylvania continues on WBRE-TV. Just about 9.30 on a Saturday morning. Heavy fog this morning. Yeah. Pea soup fog. That's right. I saw right. it when I was Ugh. driving in. Oh, Made I'm me so hungry. afraid of hitting one yeah. of those deer. Oh, I know. Especially early morning like that Absolutely. and thick, thick fog out there. Well, the fog's beginning to lift, but the clouds are going to remain, and that means some showers and thunderstorms by this afternoon. Temperature should be about 70 degrees. Tomorrow, not a bad day. Cloudy in the morning, then a little bit of sunshine in the afternoon, mid-60s. Monday, cloudy, some rain, 60. Tuesday, 60, sunshine and clouds, and partly sunny on Wednesday, 64. Trivia question? Lauren, you got it right. I know it. When high and low pressure systems are close together, what happens? Strong, gusty winds. Hmm. So there you go. Because you have a... Wow, I'm a, I'm a weather difference. whiz. That's right. You got it. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you, John.
Well, if you are just joining us, here are some of the stories making headlines this Saturday morning. Several nasty crashes overnight. In fact, one vehicle lands in a river. Plus, an exclusive report on the young man who is refusing a blood transfusion for religious reasons. A terrible car crash in Lackawanna County has sent at least four people to the hospital. That's our lead story today. It happened just after 5 o'clock on the I-380 West ramp near exit 1 at Tide Street. A Chevy Blazer with four passengers inside was hit from behind by a tractor trailer. Those inside the Blazer were taken to Scranton area hospitals. The driver of that rig was not seriously hurt. Four teenagers from our area spent last night, a good part of the night at least, in the hospital. Their pickup truck ran off the road and ended up in the Lackawanna River. The crash happened just before 11 o'clock last night on Brighton Avenue in Scranton. Police tell us there were five teenagers in the pickup when it hit the water. They were able to get out of the truck on their own. One of the kids ran from the scene, but the other four were taken to the hospital for possible hypothermia. No one was seriously injured. Investigators tell us this morning that alcohol was not a factor in the crash and that charges will not be filed in that accident. An inmate at the Carbon County Prison is now charged with raping a young girl repeatedly during a 10-year period. Police say that 34-year-old Blaine Arner started sexually molesting the girl back in 1986 when she was just six years old. He continued the attacks at a home in West Penn Township, Schuylkill County, until November of last year. The charges against him include rape, involuntary deviate sexual intercourse, and corruption of minors. Police say he is currently in prison on counts that aren't tied to the charges made yesterday. Lackawanna County officials say it is a case that escalated from obscene phone calls to sexual assault. 36-year-old Mike Malone of Roaring Brook Township is under arrest. His alleged victim is only 16. Police say the phone call started in September, then escalated to incidents where the victim was allegedly grabbed, then more recently sexually assaulted. Police say Malone threatened the 16-year-old, saying he'd kill her if she told anybody. But she did. Malone now faces five counts ranging from assault to stalking. Evidence no longer useful to the Scranton Police Department went up in flames, but it wasn't an accident. It was a court order. The destruction was approved by a county court as part of the city's effort to clear space and records following the disappearance of some evidence last year. All the evidence destroyed was no longer needed by police. A state police probe resulted in the arrest of Officer William Sikoski last year. The old evidence went up in smoke at the Red Cross incinerator in Hanover Township. We now know what sparked a fire that destroyed a Luzerne County business and left five people homeless. Fire investigators tell us an electrical short caused this blaze that ripped through Keystone Kitchen and Bath in Butler Township. That's near Hazelton. The place went up in flames Thursday night. In fact, Route 309 was closed for several hours while firefighters did their work. Five people lived in apartments upstairs. They all got out safely. A Wilkes-Barre woman is lucky to be alive this morning, and she has a four-legged friend to thank for that. Helen Bowanko was sleeping when a grease fire started on her stove at her Custer Street home. The neighbor's dog was barking so much, residents went to see what was wrong, saw the smoke, and called fire officials. Helen got out of the house, and she is now doing fine. Now, the best newscast in Pennsylvania continues on WBRE-TV. We're back, and we have another look at some very wet weather, right? That's right. By later on this afternoon, lots of showers and some thunderstorms. If I could speak today, that would be a miracle, wouldn't it? <laughs> anyway, here's <laughs> the big <laughs> five-day forecast. Today, 70 degrees, showers and some thunderstorms. Tomorrow, cloudy to begin, and then some sunshine, 65. Monday, cloudy, some showers, 60. Tuesday and Wednesday, partly sunny, with highs between 60 and 65. Now, here's the trivia question. A long, steady rain is most likely associated with a... Lauren? Stationary front. That's Stationary right. front. Got it right again. Two, two for two. two. That's right. Two for two it's today. A good weekend for you. Okay, John. <laughs> Wish it was better weather. Thank you, John. Well, last night's performance of Old Calcutta at the Kirby Center in Wilkesbury was, you could say, deflowered. That's right. The show went without its lead actress, Jennifer Flowers. Oh, Calcutta first opened on Broadway nearly 30 years ago and is a celebration of the sexual freedom of the 60s. The review featured skits, dancing, and full frontal nudity. Jennifer Flowers, who claims she had an affair with President Clinton, did not perform as scheduled last night. Management says she is now out of the play due to contractual differences. Well, that will do it for this edition of Eyewitness News Saturday morning. Thanks for watching. 
Saved by the Bell is coming up next on WBRE-TV. Join the team for more news. That's us on Midday. Take care.